with Scott Foster. Hi, so welcome to the history of my new podcast series where I bring you a topic. We talk about the history of it and anything that goes along with it. And for my first episode, since it is Super Bowl weekend, we are going to talk about the history of this annual championship game of the National Football League, where since 2004 has been played on the first Sunday in February. And it wasn't always called the Super Bowl, but it has evolved into one of the biggest sporting events, one of the biggest social events, certainly in America, but also even across the world, in Europe. People people in the UK stay up late for it. People in Australia get up really early the next day for it. So here we are. We'll start off with the origins of the Super Bowl. Touchdown! In 1958, the New York Giants and the Baltimore Colts were the NFL championship game. It came down to a tie, and they went into overtime. And watching the game were millionaires Lamar Hunt and Bud Adams. They had eventually had this little tiff with the current commissioner, Pete Rizal, and they decided to create their own football league, the American Football League. Hunt would take ownership of the Kansas Kansas City Texans, later which changed to the Chiefs, and Adams would own the Houston Oilers, which today are the Tennessee Titans. Now, of course, like the history of any new sport or league, they struggled a little bit, but then eventually they became a thing. It led to a competition. Both leagues eventually negotiated a deal that would initially bring the leagues together for a championship game. No, it wasn't yet called the Super Bowl. It was called something a little more exciting. The AFL-NFL World Championship Game. Did I say exciting? Yes. Imagine the announcers saying that. Boring. So, eventually, Hunt also helped to bring about the name change to what would eventually know as the Super Bowl. He also encouraged adding the Roman numeral, and he said it, it made the game much more magisterial. I don't think he was thinking way, way into the future when he made us casual viewers think about Super Bowl 55 and what that would look like in numerals when we saw it up in the big screen. We're like, wait, what number is that again? For those of us that have trouble doing numeral numbers like me. So eventually, eight years after the AFL was born, the first Super Bowl was played. Vince Lombardi's Green Bay Packers beat up the Kansas City Chiefs in a sleeper of a Super Bowl, 35 to 10. Both CBS and NBC broadcasted the event, the first time and the last that two networks would broadcast a major event, or at least the Super Bowl. The first Super Bowl drew only 26.8 million viewers. Now, you compare that roughly to today, where we have 100 million viewers that watched last year's matchup between the Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers. And can't imagine what the rating, what the viewership will be for this year's Super Bowl when you have the matchup of the outgoing GOAT and a potential future GOAT. Combine that with the pandemic and the lockdowns. And who knows, viewer numbers could be well into the hundreds. And there's a little bit about the origin, the history of the Super Bowl. When we come back, a look at some of the spectacles that have since become part of the Super Bowl phenomenon. The halftime acts, and of course, the Super Bowl ads. And now, a word from our sponsors. Every August or September, I anticipate the announcement of who will play at this year's Super Bowl, and I cannot wait. No, I'm just kidding. I really don't wait in anticipation like a kid on Christmas, because I'm usually disappointed anyway. But the fact remains that the Super Bowl halftime show is a spectacle. It's a huge part of the Super Bowl, and it has become so, and it has its own history. 
Early Super Bowls featured halftime shows consisting of marching bands from colleges or local high schools and some other kind of variety acts. Now, unlike the regular season or the playoff games, there's 30 minutes for halftime at a Super Bowl. Now, back in Super Bowl 26, during halftime, Fox counter-programmed the show Living Color, which caused a drop in viewership during the halftime show. So, of course, the NFL, NFL is like, well, how are we going to fix this? And they decided to start seeking out A-list talent to perform during the halftime show to keep their viewers watching the Super Bowl. So beginning in 1991, the halftime show featured pop music acts, starting with the new kids on the block. And in 1993, Mike, they got Michael Jackson to do the Super Bowl halftime show, whose viewership and performance ratings were bigger than the, sh- than the game itself. Pretty amazing. So you knew they were onto so- something. And of course, they just kept getting bigger and bigger names. And for me, one of my highlights, seeing my favorite band, play during the Super Bowl halftime came in 2002 when U2 performed. And particularly, it was the Super Bowl after 9-11, which during Where the Streets Have No Name, the band projected the victims of the attacks on a large projection screen, which, come on, doesn't get much more powerful than that. And that's what you want from a Super Bowl act. If if you were going to make your fans sit in their couches, sit in the stands, Watch this. You want something that's going to really keep them. Of course, how about Super Bowl 38? Do you remember the Carolina Panthers' first trip to the Super Bowl against Tom Brady's and his Patriots' second trip to the Super Bowl? Of course not. You don't remember that. You remember the 2004 Super Bowl for the controversial halftime show in which Janet Jackson gave what has been in the cause the wardrobe malfunction when Justin Timberlake grabbed her somehow and exposed a breast. And so along with the rest of the halftime show, the FCC cracked down and that began a widespread kind of perceived just crackdown on indecency and broadcasting in general. And MTV, which produced the halftime show, was banned from ever producing halftime shows again. And in response, the Super Bowl went back to kind of family-friendly acts during the the Super Bowl halftime. So they brought in groups from like the 70s and 80s, like The Who and Bruce Springsteen and Paul McCartney to perform. So obviously that didn't play well with the younger crowd or people who didn't really know their music or care for the music. So since 2010 and Super Bowl 45, the halftime show has returned to feature contemporary musicians, people that people can relate to and know, or at least most of the folks, folks that they really want to draw the viewership from. And now it's really just about one headliner and having a bunch of friends play. Who is your favorite? Who is your favorite act that you've ever seen play the Super Bowl halftime show? There's been a lot, of course. Everybody raves about Prince's uh, performance. Lady Gaga's got a, had, a, had a great one in there. J-Lo's had, some good one, had a good one. Who is your favorite performer at the Super Bowl? Let me know. Now, in case you're curious, the NFL does not pay the halftime show performance and appearance fee, though it does cover all the expenses for the performance, their entourage. And, you know, we know some of these people have huge entourages. Also, their bands, their technical crew, security, and their family and friends. Isn't that nice? Now, talked a little bit about what drew, what created this phenomena of of acts during the Super Bowl, the counter programming, and let's talk a little bit about counter programming to the Super Bowl. As I mentioned earlier, back in the 90s, 1990, in fact, against Super Bowl 26, Fox aired an episode of In Living Color to counter program against the Super Bowl. And it did impact the Super Bowl. The ratings dipped as other people switched the channels. And so this has been a trend. And 
even though it's the most consistently watched sports television event in the United States, there are people, it's, every year we have networks and other shows that counter-program against it by intentionally running new programming against it, often usually during the halftime, so you switch and go over there because you don't want to see Justin Timberlake or, or somebody else play in the Super Bowl halftime show. Now, of course, we all know about the annual Puppy Bowl, a special feature where the dogs play in the middle of a football stadium. And it's always, always fun to watch because who does not want to watch dogs play football? As odd and crazy as that sounds. So just some other things that have counter-programmed against the football game. You had... Of course, MTV took the reins way early back in the 90s, and they did, especially when Beavis and Butthead were popular, they had the Butt Bowl. And don't think I ever watched the Butt Bowl. But I did watch their Celebrity Deathmatch, which was a new show that they put out, which was a claymation event of pitting celebrities against each other. Howard Stern versus Kathy Lee, Pamela Anderson versus RuPaul. Hanson versus the Spice Girls? Who wouldn't want to see that claymation celebrity death match? Even the, the Wrestling Federation put something up against it. They did a special uh, event during halftime back in the 1990s with The Rock and Mankind, graduate of SUNY Cortland. And uh, so always, there's somebody who was always getting into it. Now, of course, back in the early 2000s, you had the pay-per-view event, the Lingerie Bowl, where you had an all-female players playing football in lingerie and shoulder pads and helmets. Now, oddly enough, that was so successful that it even spawned a lingerie football league for a few year years. And, of course, you also had the, once in a while, you had the more racy pay-per-view event of Girls Gone Wild halftime games. And actually, that was produced by one of my fraternity brothers from SUNY Cortland, Zane Lamprey. And I did not watch that because I didn't know about it back then. But I might have had I known. Of course, the Puppy Bowl it happens every year. It's gonna, it goes on. And it's always there. Now it's also evolved into the Kitten Bowl. And having op other opportunities for kittens and other animals to play. Just some of the wildest things of the counter-programming that happens during the Super Bowl. Now, out of respect for the fellow NFL broadcasters, whoever doesn't have the Super Bowl that year of the three major networks that usually do carry it, typically do not schedule new programming or counter-programming on the night of Super Bowl. Isn't that nice? In the age of networks fighting with each other, with each, with each other and trying to outdo each other, they at least they're nice to each other on one night of the year. What has been your favorite counter programming? Do you watch counter -pro programming during the Super Bowl? Is there a memorable event for you? Maybe like the first Puppy Bowl or last year's Puppy Bowl? Let me know. When we come back, we are going to talk about and finish up with everybody's favorite and what some people even look to this night for more than the Super Bowl, and that is the Super Bowl ads. So if you like music, and you like the sound of my voice, and you have not yet downloaded the Station Head app, only for Apple at this moment, go ahead and do that. And the Station Head app allows you to integrate your Spotify or your Apple Music and create your own DJ show, create your own radio station, and Come over and listen to my station, A.D. Foster. No underscore, just A.D. Foster. And I play the best of film scores and hard rock and heavy metal. I call it popcorn and stage diving. So if you like that kind of music, you can find me. You can listen to me. And uh, I come on there once in a while, every twice as, as much as I can a day and give a little bit of uh, my own radio DJ show. And you can make your own. Whatever your music is, you can import your playlists into your the Station Head app and create your own DJ radio show. It's pretty cool. I really like it. 
So I encourage you to come on over and say hi. Big event we're all looking forward to Sunday night, the Super Bowl ads. That's right, the Super Bowl ads. Over 400 million people will watch the Super Bowl on Sunday. It's evolved into a cultural phenomenon. There are people who haven't watched a single NFL game all season long that will watch the Super Bowl on Sunday night. Whether it be the privacy of their home and just have it on, whether it be a party with friends at a bar, what have you. And now with social media, especially with Twitter, the thoughts, reactions, and commentary is instantaneous. Live tweeting the Super Bowl is now a thing. And those Super Bowl ads start at the pregame all the way to the end. And how much do they cost? $5 million, some over $5 million, probably for the 60-second ads. Compared that, that to $40,000 in 1970. What is our fascination with the Super Bowl ads? Where do they come from? It's become so much more than just watching the football game and seeing who wins or who loses, especially if your team's not in it. It becomes, it's now become the ads. The ads are a part of the three, four, five hours that we spend and we'll have the Super Bowl on. So my question to you, do you watch the Super Bowl for the ads or do you watch it for the Super Bowl? Obviously, I'm guessing it's for, for a lot of people, it depends on what teams are in it. If my team's not in it, do I care? Or am I just watching it for the sport? Am I watching it for the ads? This year, probably watching it for the ads. And so in terms of your favorite ads, do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite of all time? There's the ads of yesteryear. They keep getting clever and clever each year, and especially with the digital age and the technology, what we can do with a commercial now is so much more CGI and special effects and things like that. It's all evolved, just like the game has. Let me share with you my favorite Super Bowl ad. It's from a couple of years ago, but it's still one of my favorites. <laughs> If you don't know what that was from, that is uh, the Budweiser ad from the late 90s. And it was kind of before they started using the horses. It became its own little phenomenon, and they went on to have their own set of commercials. How about you? Let me know what your favorite Super Bowl ad is. And now there's this phenomenon that we always do gather around the TV and wait for kickoff to see those, that's those first set of ads. We didn't have a clue what was going to happen, what ads were going to be shown. But now you can find online what ads are going to be shown. Right now, you can, you can look and it'll tell you every ad that's going to be shown during the Super Bowl. Every major one, anyway. The national ads. What are your opinion about that? I, li I, like, the, I like the surprise of it. The surprise of seeing the ad, reacting to the ad, and not knowing it's coming. To me, I think that's, that's the whole fun of what used to be the whole phenomenon surrounding the Super Bowl ads. Now we kind of know some of them are even aired already. They're aired before the Super Bowl even is, is you know, plays one down. But yet it's out there. What's your opinion about that? I, I, I'm not crazy about that. I'm a little disappointed that we've, that the, it's kind of, to me, I equate it with how Black Friday has gotten earlier and earlier as the years have progressed. Black Friday now starts Thanksgiving morning, whereas the ads for the Super Bowl start even before Super Bowl Sunday. 
And then there's the ranking. Super Bowl is over with. Your team has won. Your team has lost. Nobody cares who won. But now the talk is all about the best ad. Who has the best ad? Is it a car commercial? Is it a soda commercial? Is it a beer commercial? That's the fun part. What in your office or your place of work on Monday morning will get more conversation? The Super Bowl or the Super Bowl ads? Talk to me. Tell me your favorite Super Bowl ad, especially if you're listening after the Super Bowl. Thanks for hanging with me here on My Who Podcast, History Of, as we talked about the Super Bowl. I got more coming up in the future, including the history of donuts, the history of two big staples of New York City, Central Park, and one of the longest running TV franchises, Law & Order. Until then, let me know what you thought in the comments, or tweet me, or send me an Instagram, ad underscore foster. Let me know what you think. And if you got an idea for a history of, let me know that too. Until then, be safe and enjoy life. And don't forget to smile.